Thank you, everybody, for coming to our uh, Pediatric Grand Rounds presentations. We're going to start with Dr. Uh, Aparna Rama Subramanian, and she is going to present a three-year-old with uh, retinoblastoma. So we have at, at presentation a two-year-old who was noted to have a white reflex by the grandfather and this is the white reflex that you see in the left eye. On close, closer examination of the leukocoria, you see it is a nasal leukocoria. Um, so on the first examination under general anesthesia, it was a large nasal tumor with a lot of vitreous seeding and some heme right here and a lot of vitreous heme inferiorly. So by the international classification of retinoblastoma, this would be a group E tumor. And the other eye was perfectly normal. There was no family history of retinoblastoma. And this is the ultrasound, really large nasal tumor measuring 13 millimeters with a lot of intratumoral uh, calcification. So definitely no doubt that this is a retinoblastoma. Uh, and this is the fluorescein angiography showing a lot of hyperfluorescence in the tumor. There was no new vascularization of the iris <coughs> and the intraocular pressure was normal. So the options at that time were we could, of course, enucleate the eye. We could do systemic chemo, though uh, the penetration into the vitreous is not very good. So that was not an option at that time. Radiation therapy, we do not use it as a primary, th primary treatment anymore because these kids are radiosensitive and, at, uh, and are at a risk for secondary cancers. So definitely these two were not options. So the main two options available to us were in, uh, enucleation or intra-arterial. If we go back uh, to our pictures, this kid actually has an intact macula. It's all a nasal tumor, uh, though it is a group EI and had a lot of vitreous seeding. We discussed with the family, and the plan was to go ahead with the intra-arterial chemotherapy. Now, uh, for people who, are, who have not seen the intra-arterial chemotherapy technique, it is done by the interventional radiologist. Um, we have Dr. Fiola at Primary Children's who's doing it right now. So basically what we do is we go through the femoral artery, we cannulate the internal carotid artery, and you see here you are right up to, this is the ophthalmic artery branch, you go up to the ostium of the ophthalmic artery, you do a fluoroscopy to confirm that the, the artery is perfusing, and then you deliver chemo. There are a lot of chemos that are being used for intra-arterial uh, intra chemotherapy. Primary treatment is with melphalan, and if there is no response, there are some people who do topotecan in addition to melphalan. For this kid, we did only melphalan, and after we do the chemo, we have to do uh, cerebral angiography to make sure you have not thrown a clot anywhere. So this kid actually had three sessions of melphalan, five milligram every month, and, uh, you know, from a systemic standpoint, this treatment is really good. These kids don't have to be hospitalized. They never require blood transfusion, but you have to do weekly CBCs, and usually you do see a dip in the, in the WBC count. And the ANC can come down almost up to a zero in some cases, but I've never had to give transfusion to any of them. We just give the regular chemo precautions, say, you know, stay away from sick people and that kind of stuff. So you see here, after the first chemo, the ANC dipped down to 0 0.9. With subsequent intra-arterials, usually the dip is more, and the lowest this kid got was 0 0.6, and never got any serious infection or needed antibiotics. So that is the nice thing about the intra-arterial, that it is very concentrated in the eye, and the systemic side effects are, are you know, hardly, hardly there. So this is the tumor response after the three cycles of uh, intra-arterial. You see that the main tumor has shown a very nice response, but you see the ton of vitreous seeds, because some of the main tumor has also broken off as seeds. And this is the ultrasound. If we do a before and after, you see this was the original tumor and has shown a very nice response. The tumor itself has gone from a 13 to a 3.59. So the tumor has shrunk very nicely, uh, but then you have all these vitreous seeds. And people who do retinoblastoma will tell you that, you know, in the story of retinoblastoma, the vitreous seeds are the villains. They are the hardest to treat. They are just, you know, they are just a lot of trouble. So the options at this time, again, we again have, uh, we could still enucleate this eye. 
Uh, we could do systemic chemo. Uh, chemo really does not penetrate into the vitreous, so that's really not an option. Radiation, yes, it does work for vitreous seeds, but again, only a 50 percentage response for vitreous seeds. And then we have the newer treatment, intravitreal chemotherapy, which was a taboo many, many years ago, saying you never stick a needle in a retinoblastoma patient's eye, but that has changed now, and they found that intravitreal chemotherapy has a success rate close to 83 percentage, which is higher than radiation therapy. So after discussion with the family, we decided to go ahead with the intravitreal chemotherapy, because like you said before, the kid's macula is still intact and has good potential for vision. So we went ahead with intravitreal chemotherapy. Before we do the intravitreal chemotherapy, we decide the quadrant that has the least number of vitreous seeds, and we always inject through the same quadrant for all the sessions, because the quadrant in which you're injecting, you do compromise RP in that region, because there'll be a lot of RP mottling in that area. So you always go through the same, same quadrant. And before you do it, you do a UBM to make sure that there's no ciliary body involvement in the region where you're injecting. And then uh, you do a vitreous tap. The first time, you do an anterior chamber vitreous tap to make sure there are no retinoblastoma cells in the anterior chamber. You don't have to do that with subsequent uh, injections, just the first one. And if there are no cells seen, then like any intravitreal injection, you mark, um, so somewhere between 3 and 3.5 based on the child's age, you inject the intravitreal, and as soon as you withdraw the needle, you do cryotherapy right at the site where the needle has gone in, and you do a triple freeze thaw cryotherapy. This is so that even if some cells are trying to come out, you are going to freeze them right then and there, and after that, you kind of juggle the eye so that you uh, let the medication penetrate all around the vitreous. So after five cycles of melphalan alone, we started with a 20 microgram of melphalan, and we slowly escalated it up to a maximum of 25 for this kid. There are some, there are some people who would go up to 30 micrograms, and Dr. Hoffman here would you know, tell you about a patient that had severe toxicity with a 30 microgram. So I usually never go up to a 30. I just do it between 20 and a, 25 is kind of like my limit. After I have tried 20 for a few times, I know the eye is able to tolerate it, then I might go up to a 25. So with the melphalan alone, the inferior vitreous seeds you see have really nicely responded. All these are just calcified seeds, but there is a central glob which really ha has maybe shrunk a little bit because it's not as fuzzy as the other one, but really not a very good response. <clears throat> so at this time, we could have continued giving the melphalan, but I decided to go ahead and add topo tecan uh, along with the melphalan, and this kid got three additional cycles of melphalan with topo tecan. Um, the other thing that I started doing at that point, I'm not sure if that helps and it's not been reported, is to keep the child in the required position 15 minutes after I do the injection. Melphalan is supposed to last up to half an hour in the vitreous cavity, so kind of like 15 minutes. In this case, it was all anterior vitreous, so maybe a prone position would help. I don't know if that helps, but I started doing that, and we did melphalan. I've stepped down the dosage of melphalan because it will just be too toxic for the eye. So melphalan 20 and topotecan 20, this kid got three cycles, and it's hard to appreciate on the photographs, but this is all non-calcified vitreous seeds, whereas these are all calcified, except this one is not completely calcified, but still these are predominantly, this uh, bulk of vitreous seed here, I would say it's 90 percentage calcified. So there is still that 10 percentage that's not calcified, but we kind of reached the eight cycle maximum for this kid, and after this I've been watching him for two months now, and the seeds haven't changed at all. And sometimes they say that the time you inject to the time you see a response, there's sometimes a lag of two to three months. So we're just closely watching this kid. He's very stable. He actually has a vision of 2060 because that macula is intact and we, we are doing patching treatment right now. So hopefully he might get a little better or maybe not. So, uh, so it is a little bothersome to see those seeds, but as long as you monitor them very closely, and see that they haven't changed. Some of the seeds never get calcified. So, so this kid is going to be closely monitored up till age five. Uh, we did do genetic analysis for the, for the kid, and he did not have the germline mutation. 
Any questions? Yes. Well, you, you covered that beautifully, and I think the, the issues here are, especially when we're talking about Indian Israel and what they're able to do. But then the intra-arterial goes wonderfully when the tumor's still attached to the blood supply. Mm -hmm. Very narrow. And so, you know, you just you kind of have to hold your breath when you're doing that. We don't have enough specimens looked at of the nucleation later with this year's piece to know at what point you worry and at what point you don't. And I think what you're using as a follow-up is whether they're calcifying or not, whether it looks like they're breaking down or mm -hmm. whether they're still active and still growing. And, and it's really hard to tell, but one way to tell is if it doesn't calcify, then that's a sign probably that they're breaking down. They're inactive. The same kid, like that central glob of seeds, uh, I thought in my subsequent follow-ups, they're getting more calcified. So maybe six months down the line, you know, it'll get more calcified than it is now. It's hard to say. But. Yes. After three cycles of intra-arterial, which will be three months. Three months. Yes. So intra-arterial is given monthly. So all these kids, I usually have them see an oncologist right at the time of diagnosis. That's more so that you know they are aware of this patient in case I need systemic chemo at some point. At least we're not starting the whole process again. So I usually have them see an oncologist. And when I do the intra-arterial, you know, I usually have them look at the CBC also. And I have the you know, primary care involved in the care also in case you know, there's an infection or something. But I usually don't have them see an oncologist at a regular interval. But you know, they are in the loop, they, you know, So this change came from Switzerland. Dr. Francis Munir was the first person to start investigating intravitreal for blood from blastoma. And he did a really large study. And you know, if I remember right, it was 143 eyes, but somewhere around that range. It was somewhere between 100 and 150 eyes that he studied. And he has followed them for like four or five years now and has had no problems with metastasis. So I think it is the cryotherapy that you do right at the, at the exit of the needle that is beneficial, but I agree. Every time I inject, you know, I've done so many now, but every time I inject, you know, my heart stops because it's always in your mind that never ever inject a retinoblastoma. But it works very well. And we really did not have any options for intravitreals prior to this. Uh, sorry, for vitreous seeds prior to this, so. But we still have to find the right medication. I do not think melphalan is the right medication. We have to find a better medicine. So systemic chemo, now we are using it predominantly only for bilateral retinoblastomas. For unilateral retinoblastomas, most people would go to the intra-arterial as the first round because you really don't need to you know, give chemo to the whole body if you need to get, get it only to a one eye. There are some people who do bilateral intra-arterials for bilateral retinoblastoma. I do not believe in that at all. So for definitely systemic chemo has a huge role for bilateral retinoblastomas. Okay. Thank you.